Hi everyone, Aaron here for Zolotech, and this is the 2016 Surface Book with Performance Base. This is a newer model that has a better graphics card in the base along with a bigger battery. Now the base model without the Performance Base comes in at about $14.99 and can vary all the way up to $32.99 depending on configuration. You can get an i5 or an i7. This is about $2,400, this particular model, and this has the 6th gen or Skylake processor in it with a Core i7 2.6 dual core processor. It has the NVIDIA GTX 965M with 2 gigabytes of RAM as far as the performance base graphics card goes, and it also has 8 gigabytes of DDR3 RAM. It has an 8 megapixel rear facing camera and a 5 megapixel front facing camera. Now, the design of this is pretty nice. It's actually pretty heavy and while it's not heavier than say a 15 inch macbook pro it feels it because it's more compact it feels very sturdy it's built really well and it's made of a magnesium alloy that is pretty nice to use now the overall weight of this is about 3.63 pounds so it is pretty heavy but you get a lot for that now in the base what they've done this year because of the performance base they've actually decided to do basically what apple went the reverse of this year and instead increase the graphics capability and because they needed to do that they made the base a little bit thicker and they did that by angling the bottom and what they did was add some battery life so this part right here the way you can tell the 2016 with performance based models is this is bigger and the keyboard is inset so it's down further and that's how you can tell the performance base the other one is flush all the way across now the design of this is pretty interesting. We have the fulcrum hinge. This is that hinge right here. And it opens nicely, but it only opens so far. The angle may not be ideal for some. Now on this model, you can see, or all Surface Book models, we have two USB 3 ports. We have an SD card slot, which is great. We have magnetic attachability for your pen, which is nice. And it will fall off in a bag, but uh, if you're not shaking it around too much, it'll be pretty nice. And then on the other side, we have a proprietary port that allows you to connect to a dock. It's also your power adapter, and it's similar to what Apple has for a MagSafe. Apple got rid of it, Microsoft has kept it, and this is the way to go, really. It just clicks into place, a light com comes on, lets you know when it's done charging. Pretty simple. And then we have a mini display port right here. So that's pretty nice. We also have a headphone jack way up here, which is kind of awkward when it's on the laptop mode, but not so awkward when you have it as a digital clipboard. They don't really call it a tablet. According to Microsoft, it's a digital clipboard. You'll also see we have two microphones down here, and then the whole thing is just pretty solid. You'll see we have vents all the way around. We have our power and volume button. So that part's pretty nice. So you've got all sorts of vents for the power. Now what's neat that they did is they put all of that power in the top. So this whole top piece here, is actually where the processor RAM and the onboard graphics are. The dedicated graphics is down here along with a larger battery. So you do get some battery up here, but you get it down here as well. So that's pretty interesting that they've split that up. Now, obviously you can do one thing that a lot of people are familiar with. You can just eject the top. So if you want to eject it, open it up, hold this button down, it gives a satisfying click and you can just pull this off. Now, one thing you actually can do is pull this off if you pull really hard because this doesn't feel like there's any latch here. So if you just yank on it really, really hard, it will pop off. You don't really want to do that. This is a nice kind of neat latch system that's in here. And it's pretty interesting how that works. So if we want to put it back in place, now it's in place and it's not going anywhere. So that's pretty nice. When it comes to using the device, the keyboard is top notch. Microsoft makes probably my favorite keyboard and mice, and this is no exception. This has great travel, and while I can get used to the new MacBook, this is definitely better as far as that goes. It has a backlight, it's got three steps of lighting, so you can have it on off, which looks pretty good now, turn it on a little bit, which kind of makes the keys fade out, so it's hard to see them, turn it on again, and again, full brightness. So it's kind of hard to see the keys in daylight with the backlight on, but you don't really need it then. So it goes from kind of a black color to white. Not a huge deal, but it's really nice to, to type on. You can just say, hi, how are you today? And I can just zip along really fast on this. The trackpad is 
the best I've used on a Windows machine. Now this particular trackpad is glass and it's similar to what MacBooks had before. So Apple had gotten that right a long time ago and it was good of Microsoft to do the same thing. So it clicks, it's a mechanical click, it's not a vibration like Apple does, but it has this nice little click, it's a satisfying sound, and you can use it like a normal trackpad. It's very sensitive, responds very nicely, and it's great. It's a good size. It's out of the way for your hands when you're typing, and it does a great job. Now, one of the things I found interesting is this hinge. Now, when you open it all the way, that's as far as it goes. It goes that far. It's at about a 45 degree angle or so, and you can't go any further. So depending on how you're sitting, it can be pretty inconvenient. On a desk, it's fine, but sometimes when you're sitting down, you want it to go either even further and you can't do that. What you can do is eject the base and just use it. But if you want to play a game or something like that, spin it around, click it into place and fold it back this way. There we go. Has auto rotate and it works pretty well and, it, and you're good to go. And we're in tablet mode right now. So tablet mode and you'll see it glitch there for a second. And that's pretty typical. It will do that every time it reconnects. At least it does for me. So you can use it like that. It's pretty thick and pretty heavy and you still get this gap here that people complained about before, but the gap is less now that you've got the performance base with that extra room. What they did is increase that slant. So the distance between here is smaller. Now, when I reattach this top, one thing that's pretty interesting is sometimes the speakers sound almost like they're blown, but then they come back to normal. And that's not really too much of an issue most of the time, but it's just initially when you disconnect and reconnect this, I notice the sound. The speakers sound pretty good. Let me go into it and go to one of my videos and play that. Here's one of my videos. Let me turn the volume up for you. This is my daily driver since the day it came out. It's been a few weeks now, and I wanted to take that time to find so it goes nice and loud and I can't complain as far as the speakers go. They sound really nice for a laptop. They're coming out of the top and not the base, but they sound really nice. They're always in stereo and you don't hear it from one end or the other, anything like that. Now, one thing we get that we don't get on Apple laptops is a touchscreen and this touchscreen is pretty good. So let me eject this so I can show you. We'll set the base aside. And with the base detached, this becomes the digital clipboard as Microsoft calls it. Now you're not gonna do any serious gaming or anything with this sitting like this, but you can game when it's attached to the base. And we'll talk more about that in a moment. But if you click this top, we can bring up a sticky note and just say, hi, and it works pretty good. If I wanna erase it, flip this over and erase it. That part's pretty nice. It has handwriting recognition, which just popped up there. Let's see if we can try that out. Well, let's get rid of this. There we go. And you can say hello and it will recognize your handwriting. So that's pretty nice as well. And then double click and it screen captures. So now I can draw on any part of the screen, circle things, and then send them off with the share button in the upper right. This part is pretty nice. I really like it. So we can take this, circle anything we want, and then you'll see lag wise, it's pretty good. It keeps up nicely. No issues there. If I don't want it, we get rid of it. And then if we long press, we get the sticky note. We can change all of these settings, of course, this being Windows, and do whatever we want. So I'll just say Zolotech. And then I can add another note. And it's pretty nice. It works really well. And then when I don't want to use it, I can either get rid of these and then plug it into the base and use it as a normal laptop. So let's do that. Now using it as a normal laptop is pretty nice. You can hook up a mouse or whatever you'd like, and it's pretty fast. So if we go into the Heaven benchmark, and it's hard to see it right here, but it's on extreme. I hit run, and you'll see it runs actually pretty good. We'll wait for it. It will take a moment to load, and it will pop up. So you're not going to be doing any serious gaming on here, but you'll see right now we're running at about 25 frames per second in the upper right. and it runs fairly smoothly and this is on extreme. So this is in the full resolution mode and here it's running at 37 frames per second. Now where it really struggled was when I ran Cinebench. So let me close this out. You'll see when I run Cinebench, it's really not so great. It runs very slowly, very choppy and the CPU score was only 219. So it's, it's not so great as far as that part goes, but we're not really using it for high end cinema production. Uh, you could use Adobe Premiere on it, uh, but if we want to game on it, it actually is surprisingly good. 
Now, one of the things with city skylines, as you'll notice, it's kind of got black bars on the left and right. And that's a result of its aspect ratio. This is a 3000 by 2000 display with 267 pixels per inch. So it looks great. It's got a 3-2 aspect ratio and it's 1700 to 1 contrast ratio. And it's really, really nice. It's 13.5 inches from corner to corner and overall is nice. So if I use my mouse here, you'll see I'm running at a consistent above 30 frames per second in the bottom left. So it's moving pretty nicely. Let's get to where we actually have something going on. And I have a mod on, so I'm actually running with all of these squares unlocked. So it's pretty good as far as that goes. So it runs nicely. I can spin around and play it pretty well. It's not too much of an issue as far as that goes. But the fans do start to spin up when you play. On Planet Coaster, it's actually pretty good. The settings are on low, so they, they don't look phenomenal, but it runs between 40 and 60 frames per second. So if I click on the, the roller coaster and jump on board, you'll see it runs pretty smoothly. Let's go back here. And it's not so bad. So it's surprisingly good. It's very playable as far as that goes. And the one thing you do get from playing games are the fans. They actually spin up pretty loud. So let's... let's quit Planet Coaster, and when I was doing benchmarking, they were really loud. They start to whistle, they're so loud. But as soon as you quit a game like that, they actually go silent again. So they're only spun up when you're doing that. Now one of the interesting things is I could play that game for quite a few hours before the battery goes dead. The battery down here actually shows battery one and battery two. You've got a battery in the top and the bottom. And what happens is, is they charge separately sort of. So if you, you plug it into the base, this is not charged by the base. The base is charged by the wall, which then in turn charges the screen. So you have to charge them either separately and you can charge the base and the top separately. But if you plug it in, it just charges like a normal laptop and fills them both up, but they won't charge one another. Now the battery usage, Microsoft says it will get about 16 hours in normal use. I'd say it's more like 8 to 10, depending on what you're doing, especially if you're playing games or editing with, say, Premiere, that's going to slow that down quite a bit. As far as battery life, though, I think you'll be pretty impressed. I think easily you'll get through a day. One of the things people are interested in, aside from the touchscreen, is the new Surface Dial. And this Surface Dial was showcased with the new Surface Studio. And one of the things they did was stick it to the screen. And there's actually no interaction between it and the display. And you'll see it just did something interesting. It's still on, but I can't see it. It's just too dark. It adjusted the brightness, and it's almost unusable. I can hardly see the screen. So the screen just went dark. It was automatically adjusting the brightness. It's bright in here, so it should have been bright, and it went really dim. And I had to actually barely be able to see that and change it. So it's done that to me a few times. But one thing I think people are interested in is this Surface Dial. And the Surface Dial was shown off with the Surface Studio and shown that you could put it on the display. It doesn't work with the display as far as the Surface Book is concerned. It only works as a dial on your table. So for example, one of the things you can do with it is scroll. You'll see the window up here is scrolling. You can scroll with it. If you push and hold, it pops up a menu on the display and it allows you to adjust volume, zoom in, or undo. That's really all it does in the main Microsoft Windows application. But if you use it in something like Photoshop or one of the applications they showed such as Sketchable, it can do a few more things. Now this is the application Sketchable that is a free application to download and they showcase on the Surface Studio. So if you put this on here, it doesn't do anything. But if I put it over to the side, it adjusts volume. But if I click here, you'll see I can adjust HSB, RGB, brush. So if I click on brush, it wants me to buy a lot of features, but there's certain things I can do with it that it will let me do as far as colors. So if I go to RGB, now I can adjust the colors with the dial. So you can just draw whatever you want to do and then push the dial. And then you have a couple other options. You can dial back the undo. So it's got some interesting uses, but I don't know that you want to run out and buy it for $100 to use it with this particular device. It's probably better on the Surface Studio. The brightness of the display is pretty good. Let me show you with the dial. It's all the way up. I can spin it down. Tap and hold, and I can adjust volume. 
up and down. So it works well, but you just can't use it on this display. It only works on the Surface Studio that way. Instead of Touch ID, Microsoft has opted for a visual recognition system. Open the laptop, it looks at your iris, makes sure it's you, and logs in that quickly. It's using the cameras up here to do that, and it works really well. Let me lock it and show you again one more time. And it's that quick. So it's pretty nice, and it works well almost every single time. In conclusion, I think the Surface Book is for those that want to do serious work and be able to game as well or do maybe some video production. You can actually do Premiere on here, use Premiere Pro or whatever editing program you'd prefer. It's got a great display for that. But if you want to also game, you can do that as well. But in doing that, this is a compromise somewhere in between. If you're someone that wants to mark up their, their screen, mark up a document, send it on to a colleague to continue working or show them that, this is gonna be a great device. But if you're someone that wants a dedicated tablet, the Surface Pro 4 is better for that. If you're someone that wants a dedicated gaming machine, there's less expensive and better machines for that in the same price range as this. Uh, it may be 400 to $800 cheaper, you can get a very powerful gaming machine, or you could build a desktop. So that's really what you need to decide. But if you really want a nice looking display that people ask what it is, it's really interesting looking, has this interesting fulcrum hinge, and is just kind of the best of what Microsoft has to offer as far as user experience, this could be it. One thing I didn't mention though, is when gaming with it, it wasn't a seamless experience. And that's what Microsoft is going for here. When I went to play Forza Horizon 3, it doesn't play very well frame rate wise, but they did show it and I used an Xbox controller. And the problem I had is it wouldn't run without graphic drivers. And it told me to go to Microsoft, do a Windows update, I did that, there was no drivers. I had to go to Nvidia update using their drivers there and then it worked fine, but still not at a great frame rate. So that whole seamless experience isn't quite there, at least it wasn't in my experience. That said, I think most people that buy this and are regular Windows users are going to love this machine. But again, if you want a dedicated graphics machine or gaming machine, you can build one for far less or buy a laptop with much higher specs for the same price or less. But that's pretty much it. If you've used a Surface Book, especially with the performance base, let us know your thoughts in the comments below. If you haven't subscribed already, please subscribe and like. As always, thanks for watching. This is Aaron. I'll see you next time.